and welcome or welcome back to Tala Talks NICU, where we take ridiculously complicated medical concepts and make them super easy for you to understand and hopefully retain forever. Today we are going to go over part four of NEC. This is the final video in the series. If you watch all of them, you will know so much about NEC. So please go back and watch parts one, two, and three, which are on the pathophysiology or what causes NEC as well as the prevention. Video two is on the diagnosis of NEC. Video three is on the treatment of NEC. And this one is on the outcomes after a baby develops NEC. As we've talked about several times, neck is really bad. It causes a lot of bad short-term as well as long-term outcomes. A recent paper published in 2019 in Contemporary Pediatrics really summarizes all the different complications from necrotizing enterocolitis. And as you can see, it is perfectly all summarized in this table. There are both short and long-term complications of both the gut as well as just general symptoms. Let's start with mortality. As we have said over and over again, and this is really based on several large studies, the mortality from neck overall is about 20%. But if a baby ends up needing surgery, then the mortality is really higher than that, somewhere between 30 and 50%. Thankfully, most babies don't end up needing surgery. And so really overall, that overall mortality with all neck included is about 20%. As you can imagine, the younger and the smaller the baby is when they get neck or really even when they're born, then the higher the chance that they will die from neck and the higher the chance that they will end up needing surgery. Going back to the table, we know that even if an infant survives, they are much more likely to get all those really bad three-letter acronyms that we see in the NICU. So they're way more likely to get IVH, more likely to get PVL, ROP, BPD, even PDAs. And this is most likely because of all of the inflammatory response in neck and all those circulating cytokines and inflammatory proteins that are therefore then affecting all the other systems. Again, like we said with survival, the likelihood of getting all of these, the BPD and the ROP and everything, are also much higher with surgical neck as opposed to with medical neck. Like we always say in neonatology, it's really difficult to study kind of long-term outcomes of things that happen in the NICU. But the studies that were done at 18 to 22 months show that neck really is very bad, especially surgical neck. In fact, infants that had neck had a higher incidence of having cerebral palsy, neurodevelopmental delays, a Bailey score of less than 70 at 18 and 22 months. The overall risk of having neck versus a baby that didn't have neck is about 1.5 to two times higher of having all these bad neurodevelopmental outcomes. So we know that neck is really bad for the brain. Now let's go over the gut issues as well. Obviously, when the baby acutely has neck, then there are going to be dysmotility issues. Obviously, the peristalsis isn't pushing everything forward, and we're going to have absorption issues. This is true, obviously, even in medical neck as well as in surgical neck. We always hope that this period where the gut doesn't work at all is relatively short-lived. There are two other kind of more short-term gut complications we may see after neck, and those are adhesions from surgery as well as strictures, which honestly we see very commonly in medical neck as well as in surgical neck. Adhesions occur in about 10% of babies that have had surgical neck. And basically it's when scar tissue from after the surgery just kind of wraps around a piece of bowel and causes a small bowel obstruction. Amazingly, this is one of the most common cause of small bowel obstruction in infants under the age of two. Strictures are a relatively common complication of neck, including, like I said, medical neck, and they occur in about 20% of time after an infant does have neck. Again, remember that number, 20%. So a stricture happens normally when scar tissue forms inside the intestine and causes an obstruction or a narrowing. The vast majority of time, this happens at the level of the colon, which I've always found very interesting because the colon is not normally 
one of the areas that's most commonly involved in neck. Normally it's kind of more in the terminal ilium or the whole ilium in the small intestine, but normally the strictures occur in the colon. These strictures normally develop about two to four weeks after the baby had neck. So clinically, you have a baby that had neck and has started to improve. The inflammatory markers and CRP and everything is all returned to normal. And then as you're slowly advancing feeds, the belly just starts getting really distended. Eventually, you're not able to feed this baby at all, and you'll get x-rays which show that the baby really does have an obstruction somewhere. If it is a stricture, then this does need to be repaired surgically. The long-term gastrointestinal issue that we always worry about is short bowel syndrome, or when we have basically intestinal failure. Crazily, neck is one of the most common causes for short bowel syndrome in young children. And short bowel syndrome happens when the intestine is just not working adequately. So when a large part of the intestine is just not able to absorb and digest the nutrients that any child needs for basic growth and metabolism. We are planning to have an entire video on short bowel syndrome. And so I'm not going to go over the specifics of what truly is considered short bowel syndrome. Also, that number seems to be really changing. Just realize that a lot of the time short bowel syndrome happens in neck because the surgeons were forced to remove so much dead gut that now there's only 30 centimeters of bowel remaining. In the past, these infants would be completely TPN dependent. And as you all know, TPN eventually leads to liver failure. And eventually, if these intestines weren't taught to kind of function again, then these babies would be candidates for intestinal and liver transplants, which were notoriously unsuccessful. The good news is, is that in the last decade or so, the entire medical teams have gotten a lot better at being able to deal with babies with short bowel syndrome. Part of this is that we have much better TPN now, or we're much better at managing TPN so that we're not necessarily destroying the liver. Part of that is the different fats that are now available for us as we administer TPN. The other part of it is that also the GI doctors have just become really quite exceptional at reteaching the intestines how to perform their functions again. Like I said, there will be a whole other video on short bowel syndrome. The last massive complication that I want to go over is the extra burden that these infants with neck put on not just the families, but on the entire healthcare system. Obviously, if a baby has neck, no matter when they get neck, then the chances of them staying in hospital a lot longer is very high. It really does markedly increase their hospitalization days. Altogether, with the increased days of hospitalization, as well as the actual management of neck, as well as the follow-up, it's estimated that the US spends about $500 million to about $1 billion every single year on this disease. So it would be amazing if we became much better at preventing it. It would be amazing if neck really never happened anymore. And I know that a lot of researchers and authors have said that really we've reached the stage where we should not be accepting neck to occur anymore in the NICUs. Hopefully we'll reach that day. Well, that marks the end of all our neck videos. I really hope that you did learn something. Please remember to like and subscribe and then let us know what you would like to hear about next. Thank you so much for being here.